Hello, and happy fall to all of you. We're finally starting to enjoy some cooler temperatures as the summer cools down. And in honor of it being October, I thought that a slightly spookier theme song would be appropriate. I'm happy to be back with you again this month to talk about one of the skills that has defined emergency medicine, airway management. We are arguably one of the best people to have in your corner when it comes to managing the challenging airway scenario. But a lot has changed in the last 10 years, both in terms of the technology and devices that are available. And some new techniques and strategies have been developed that can increase our armamentarium as well. Emergency physicians are, in general, pretty darn good at airway management. We're familiar with a wide array of techniques and devices for securing the airway, and we get a lot of training in residency to prepare us to deal with airway disasters. That being said, there are few situations in emergency medicine more stressful than a failed airway. If there are new devices or tricks I can add to my toolkit that will make these situations less frequent and hopefully less scary, then count me in. This talk is going to look at a few things. Number one, the updated guidelines from the Difficult Airway Society. I'm going to talk briefly about a few things out of this 22-page paper that I think enhance what we do in the ED, including having a definitive algorithm that declares exactly when an airway is failed. We're going to talk about video versus direct laryngoscopy, apneic oxygenation, and choice of paralytic agent. Number two, the heads-up position for pre-oxygenation and intubation. And three, the concept of delayed sequence intubation, which employs procedural sedation to facilitate pre-oxygenation as the actual procedure. Now, we could talk about airway management for hours or days. This discussion is really designed to give you a brief overview of some new and changing concepts in airway management. And if you want more, there are links to some great papers on the website that you can download and dig deeper into some of these concepts. Here's the big disclaimer for this talk. I'm assuming that you already know how to intubate. If you're looking for a discussion on how to do basic rapid sequence intubation, or a review of laryngeal anatomy, or a detailed talk about what makes an airway difficult, this isn't the talk you're looking for. This discussion assumes that you are already proficient at standard RSI technique and airway management, and is intended to bring you the most up-to-date concepts in the management of a difficult airway. That being said, even if you are less experienced at airway management, these concepts are still helpful to bring into your airway management thought process. As with most things in emergency medicine, most of us that manage airways on a regular basis have a standard approach, including a standard way we prepare prior to the procedure. And if you're like me, that involves having a backup plan, and a backup plan for the backup plan. Most of whether your airway management plan succeeds or fails happens long before you ever pick up the laryngoscope, because the preparation that happens beforehand is so important. So how do you succeed at intubation? Number one. Know what your resources are. This includes knowing what equipment you have, where to find it, as well as how to use it. It doesn't help if you have the coolest toys in the world, if nobody knows where they are or how to get access to them. It also includes knowing who you have as your backup. If you work in a small rural ED, there may not be backup. You might be the only person in the hospital that can manage an airway. Whereas if you work at a major medical center, you may be on shift with half a dozen other ED docs and have a As with most things in emergency medicine, most of us that manage airways on a regular basis have a standard approach, including a standard way we prepare prior to the procedure. And if you're like me, that involves having a backup plan, and a backup plan for the backup plan. Most of whether your airway management plan succeeds or fails happens long before you ever pick up the laryngoscope because the preparation that happens beforehand is so important. So how do you succeed at intubation? Number one, know what your resources are. This includes knowing what equipment you have, where to find it, as well as how to use it. It doesn't help if you have the coolest toys in the world, 
if nobody knows where they are or how to get access to them. It also includes knowing who you have as your backup. If you work in a small rural ED, there may not be backup. You might be the only person in the hospital that can manage an airway. Whereas if you work at a major medical center, you may be on shift with half a dozen other ED docs and have access to anesthesia colleagues, all of whom may be available to back you up. Knowing what your resources are plays a big role in how you decide to proceed. Next, go into every intubation with a plan. If you have half your algorithm in place before you start, you don't have to try and think on the fly during a stressful situation. We've all been in situations where we were feeling so stressed out by whatever medical disaster was happening that we had a hard time thinking critically. As the saying goes, you are more likely to fall back on your training. Have you ever noticed how much some medical terms sound like Harry Potter spells? For those of you who aren't giant nerds or Harry Potter fans like me, some common Harry Potter spells include things like Alohomora to unlock something, Lumos to make some light, or Wingardium Leviosa to make an object fly. So I'm guessing Hyperemesis Gravidarum should make you both pregnant and spew vomit everywhere. All of us have encountered patients that have a difficult airway to manage. It may be difficult due to the patient's anatomy, due to major facial or neck trauma, due to obesity, or to their disease process, which may be causing obstruction or making it difficult to access the airway. Or they may have a reason why they're difficult to oxygenate. Regardless of the reason, being able to recognize when a patient is likely to have a difficult airway is a skill we need to be good at because there's nothing more likely to require a change of underwear than getting yourself into a bad situation and not knowing how to get out of it. The point of this is that we need a standard approach to the patient with an unanticipated difficult airway. The main reason a failed airway tends to go bad and become a total cluster is that you didn't plan for the possibility of failure. So we need to go into every airway with the mindset of, if X fails, then Y, and if Y fails, then Z. X, Y, and Z may not be exactly the same for every single patient, but if we have a basic framework to work within that can apply to all difficult patients, it will help take some of that stress away because you aren't having to try and come up with the plan on the fly. And it needs to be relatively simple. Your ability to do things like higher math and complex problem solving is inversely proportional to your level of stress and anxiety. So don't plan on being able to recall a 12-step complicated algorithm. Let's look at some papers and see what we can do. This paper was published in November of last year and is an update to the original difficult airway guidelines that came out in 2004. A lot has changed in the last 12 years since the original guidelines. Technology has changed substantially, with a big shift away from direct laryngoscopy in favor of video devices, as well as all kinds of new adjunctive devices. A ton of new research has been done in regards to optimal patient positioning, preoxygenation, apneic oxygenation, and this paper discusses how these new advances can be applied to the management of the patient with a difficult airway. The authors offer us a sequential series of plans that we can resort to when standard RSI fails, and they are designed to try and prioritize oxygenation while limiting the total number of airway attempts in effort to minimize laryngeal trauma that may further worsen the difficulty you're facing. Now, let me just say that these ain't perfect. These guidelines were developed by anesthesiologists, and their pathway involves an option that we almost never have in the ED, which is wake the patient up and cancel the surgery. Granted, there are cases where that's not an option in anesthesia either, but the reality is that if we're intubating a patient in the ED, aborting the attempt is almost never an option. We intubate because the patient needs it, and sometimes patients roll in crashing such that we don't have the luxury of almost any kind of assessment before we have to intervene. And likewise, our patients are almost never fasted or prepared. Somehow it seems like they always just, just supersized it right before they had their emergency that landed them in the ED.
Because we work in an environment that is much less controlled than the OR, we are more likely to face the crash airway in the ED, but some of the concepts in this paper can still be helpful to us. Here's the basic outline of the algorithm they propose in the paper. Overall, I like it. It's simple, and it gives you a step-by-step -step plan of attack on how you're going to approach securing the airway in the event that one type of approach fails. Plan A is what we typically do. Attempt to intubate via direct or video laryngoscopy. Depending on your preference, you can allow up to two or even three attempts. But what's important here is to have a hard endpoint that you stick to. So if you plan to try two attempts and both of those fail, it's time to move on to Plan B. Plan B and B involves maintaining oxygenation and insertion of a supraglottic device, which should allow you some time to oxygenate the patient while you reassess the situation. You may be able to change something that will allow you to successfully intubate, like repositioning the patient or intubating through the supraglottic device. Plan C happens if the supraglottic device fails. In this scenario, you can try to ventilate via face mask, and if you can maintain ventilation this way, keep on ventilating the patient. But if you can't, it's time to very rapidly realize this and go on to plan D and perform a surgical airway. Even if you are able to ventilate via face mask, if there's no other way to secure the trachea and the patient needs a definitive airway, again, it's probably still time to progress to a surgical airway in this circumstance as well. Here's another medical term that would make a great Harry Potter spell. Polydactyl, the digit multiplication curse. It would make you sprout all kinds of extra fingers and toes. The number and types of devices available to help us place an endotracheal tube have proliferated like crazy in the last 10 years. When I trained, we basically had the choice of the Mac or Miller blades for the direct laryngoscope, and video laryngoscopy? This was new fancy pants technology that was just starting to become available. Now there are multiple types of video laryngoscopes, hyperangulated blades, fiber optic scopes, you name it. We have had both the hyperangulated and the standard geometry video scopes at our site, and while my personal preference is the standard geometry scope, they both have a number of advantages and disadvantages. Video laryngoscopy does have a few advantages over direct laryngoscopy. First of all, since VL uses a camera at the end of the laryngoscope blade, there is no need to align the eye with the airway, so you can better visualize the airway with less force than is required for direct laryngoscopy. This is particularly advantageous when intubating a potential C-spine-injured patient. These devices are easy to use and require far less training and practice than learning to use a flexible fiber optic scope. Pretty much anyone who is comfortable with standard direct laryngoscopy can be trained to use these devices rapidly and easily. They also have the benefit of being more portable and easier to clean than the flexible scopes and data reveals overall higher rates of first-pass success with these devices. On the flip side, since you're not making a straight shot to the cords, it can be a little more challenging to pass the tube, particularly when using a hyperangulated device. It often takes a little practice to figure out the technique. Plus, since the video camera is on the end of the laryngoscope, the camera might get obscured by things like blood or vomit in the airway. And since there are so many different devices and blade geometries out there, there is a greater amount of variability between devices that can make it a little bit challenging to be familiar with all of them. These devices are also more expensive than the standard laryngoscope, although these devices are getting progressively less expensive over time. Let me first say that I have no financial interest in any of these airway devices. There are easily half a dozen common video laryngoscopes out there. I've used a number of them and have opinions about them, but I don't have any relationships with the device companies. There are a number of studies out there that have tried to answer the question, which is better, 
direct laryngoscopy or video laryngoscopy. This paper was a trial of 198 patients randomized to intubation with either direct or video laryngoscopy. Their primary outcome was the rate of first pass success, which was 86% in the direct laryngoscopy group versus 92% in the video laryngoscopy group. While this was not statistically significant, it was worth noting that all eight cases of failed direct laryngoscopy were successfully rescued with video laryngoscopy. There were no differences in any of the secondary outcomes, including rates of aspiration, peri-intubation hypoxemia, hospital length of stay, or survival to discharge. This is another paper looking at the CMAC device, which is a standard geometry device, versus direct laryngoscopy in patients that were predicted to have a difficult airway. They included 300 patients, and skilled practitioners achieved higher success rates for tracheal intubation on the first attempt with video laryngoscopy, achieving this 93% of the time, than with direct laryngoscopy, in which they were successful only 84% of the time. Of note, Time to successful intubation was actually slightly faster in the DL group, 46 seconds versus 33 seconds, but there were no differences between the groups in any of the adverse outcomes. Here's another paper that randomized 200 patients undergoing general anesthesia to be intubated using direct laryngoscopy or video laryngoscopy with 100 patients in each group. Success rates were higher in the video laryngoscopy group than the direct laryngoscopy group, with 99% of patients in the video group being intubated successfully as compared to 92% in the direct laryngoscopy group. The video laryngoscopy group also required fewer rescue maneuvers and the overall time to intubation was lower. There are multiple other papers that show similar results. Some of the airway gurus in our specialty have taken the position that these video devices should be first line over direct laryngoscopy, as first pass success rates do tend to be a little higher with these devices. And for most of us, it has become more or less our first go-to rescue option in every patient with a difficult airway. But these studies also show high rates of first pass success with direct laryngoscopy, so I don't think it's time to just throw that skill away yet. A discussion of the pros and cons of direct versus video laryngoscopy could go on for hours and is way beyond the scope of what I'm trying to do here. If you're interested in that, please follow the links on the blog site for some great discussion regarding this debate. There are a whole host of supraglottic and adjunctive devices available as well. These include multiple variations on the LMA device, intubating LMAs, dual lumen supraglottic tubes, and of course, our much beloved gum elastic bougie. If the first one to two attempts at endotracheal intubation fail, placing one of these supraglottic devices is a reasonable strategy for rescue, and they allow you to continue to oxygenate the patient while you take a pause to consider your options. All of these devices have varying adjunctive capabilities. Some allow passage of an NG tube into the stomach to provide gastric decompression. Others accommodate a bougie or flexible laryngoscope. The intubating LMA is designed to accommodate passage of an ET tube. So each of these devices are a little bit different, but the most important part is to just know the capabilities of the devices that you have available at your site. There's a saying that says that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, but expecting a different result. So if you failed on your first attempt at direct laryngoscopy, why would you do your second attempt with the same technique and expect it to go any better? And yes, for all of you history sticklers out there, I know the quote probably didn't originate with Einstein, but it's still a good quote whoever said it first. I digress. The concept of the airway algorithm here is simple. If you make an attempt at laryngoscopy and fail, do something different with the next attempt. Add a bougie. Switch from direct video laryngoscopy. Optimize your patient's positioning. Ask a different person to step in and take a look. Try a supraglottic device. I know it sounds absolutely obvious, but we sometimes get so task-focused when we're stressed out that we forget to do the obvious, and we've all seen someone try over and over and over with the same technique without success.
Here's another medical term that's just begging to be a Harry Potter spell. Pectus excavatum. Let's move on and talk about apneic oxygenation. The idea behind apneic oxygenation is that by providing high flows of oxygen into the nasopharynx and oropharynx during intubation, you can create a reservoir of oxygen that can allow passive oxygenation to occur during intubation, thereby extending the safe apnea time beyond what you might be able to achieve with standard preoxygenation alone. That being said, I do want to be very clear that this is not a substitute for good preoxygenation technique. The easiest way to do it is to just stick a nasal cannula on the patient and crank the flow way up to 15 liters or higher. You can put it on right underneath your non rebreather or even under a BiPAP mask, and this will help you achieve better preoxygenation than you could with a non rebreather alone, since we all know that the non rebreather only gives you about 60% FiO2. We were all taught that a nasal cannula can't accommodate more than 6 liters per minute, and that's basically crap. You wouldn't want to do this for the long term because flow rates that high without being warmed and humidified would get really uncomfortable for the patient, but you'll really only be doing this for about 10 to 15 minutes during your preoxygenation and intubation procedure, after which it's going to be discontinued. What's the evidence that this makes a difference? This paper is a prospective randomized controlled trial that was published in the Journal of Clinical Anesthesia, and it looks at the effect of passive nasal oxygen administration on the maintenance of arterial oxygen saturation during simulated difficult laryngoscopy in obese patients. They enrolled 30 obese mice men undergoing general anesthesia, half of whom were randomized to the apneic oxygen group, called the ONASE group. The other half were randomized to no apneic oxygenation, the NONASE group. All the patients were thoroughly preoxygenated, and then they performed a simulated difficult airway where the patient under laryngoscopy, and once the cords were visualized, they just waited until they saw an SpO2 of 95% or lower, at which point the tube was passed and the time to a set of 95% was recorded. The lowest SpO2 values and time to regain a 100% SpO2 saturation, called the resaturation time, were also recorded. They found that nasal oxygen administration was associated with a significant prolongation of the safe apnea time, with patients in the nasal oxygen group maintaining a SAT of 95% or greater for 5.29 minutes versus only 3.49 minutes in the group who didn't get nasal oxygen. The group that got passive O's also had a significant improvement in the minimum SpO2 that occurred during the intubation attempt, 94% versus 87% in the non-apneic oxygenation group. Resaturation times were no different between the groups. While this was a small sample size, there was a clear increase in maintenance of oxygenation in the passive oxygenation group. Here's another paper. This one is a retrospective analysis of a prospective data set previously collected for an airway registry trial, including 728 consecutive patients that were intubated via RSI by the Greater Sydney Area Helicopter Emergency Medical Service in Australia. They compared the 310 patients who got intubated before the service introduced apneic oxygenation with 418 who underwent RSI after apneic oxygenation was included in their protocols. After the apneic oxygenation was incorporated into standard practice, the rates of desaturation to an O2 sat below 93% during the intubation attempts fell from 22.6% to 16.5%, which just achieved statistical significance. Critically ill patients are sick, and because of this, they often have higher oxygen consumption than well patients. They may also have structural respiratory compromise from ARDS, pneumonia, and so on, and they may be difficult to oxygenate because of it. The addition of PEEP can help you pre-oxygenate these patients that are often difficult to oxygenate. Non-invasive ventilation like BiPAP and CPAP can be a useful adjunct to add some PEEP to your pre-oxygenation.
and you can put it on right over the nasal cannula you're using for apneic oxygenation. Most ventilators will do this if you just hook a mask up to them, and that way you don't have to drag two different machines into the patient's room to do this. This paper looked at pre-oxygenation in ICU patients randomized to standard pre-oxygenation with bag valve mask versus positive pressure support using a ventilator to provide non-invasive ventilation. They randomized 53 patients, 26 to the control group and 27 to the non-invasive group. The non-invasive ventilation group had better pre-oxygenation, achieving a mean pulse ox of 98% as opposed to 93% in the bag valve mask group. During the intubation procedure, lower SpO2 values were observed in the control group, 81% versus 93%. 12 patients in the control group and 2 in the non-invasive group had an episode of desaturation below 80% during the intubation, but there were no significant differences between the groups in terms of adverse events. So to sum up, apneic oxygenation and PEEP are good for pre-oxygenation, and we should consider using them more routinely for our airway management strategies. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but just for the sake of completeness, let's spend a couple of minutes talking about paralytic agents. There has been a fair amount of debate regarding the choice of paralytic agent for RSI. As you all know, paralytics basically come in two flavors, depolarizing agents and non-depolarizing agents. The depolarizing agent we all know is succinylcholine, also called succimethonium outside the United States. But there are multiple non-depolarizing agents including rocuronium, vecuronium, pancuronium, cisatricurium, tubercurarine, and so on. If you dig deep and go way back to physio and farm class, you'll remember that the way your muscles work starts with the nerve terminus releasing acetylcholine in neuromuscular synapse, where it binds to the sodium-potassium ion channel on the muscle cell, opening the channel and depolarizing the cell, leading to muscle contraction. The depolarizing agents do exactly what you'd expect, they bind on the ion channel on the muscle cell in place of acetylcholine, opening the channel and locking it into the open position, causing the muscle to contract. But then it can't repolarize until the succinylcholine is metabolized by acetylcholinesterase. That's why you get muscle fasciculations followed by paralysis. That's also why the potassium goes up, because that ion channel is locked open, allowing a continuous efflux of potassium ions. By contrast, the non-depolarizing agents block the binding site of the muscular ion channels so that acetylcholine can't bind, and it locks the channels in a closed position, preventing depolarization of the muscle cell. Which paralytic you use is ultimately still a matter of personal preference. Theoretically, use of a non-depolarizing agent such as rocuronium may be a little bit superior. A depolarizing agent such as succinylcholine causes muscle fasciculations and therefore consumes some of the precious oxygen you've pre-oxygenated your patient with, shortening the safe apnea time. Succinylcholine does have the shortest duration of action, but I would caution you against expecting this to save you in the event of a difficult airway. That 5 to 10 minutes until they start to breathe again is longer than you're likely to have in a sick patient before they run out of their, out of their oxygen reserves and it doesn't solve the problem that the patient needed a secure airway in the first place. In my own humble opinion, you're far better off with a supraglottic device and a stabilized airway than relying on success short duration of action. This paper looked at the mean safe apnea time with both of these agents in obese patients. Granted, the BMI for these patients was between 25 and 30, so we're not even talking about the super obese folks we frequently encounter. The mean safe apnea time was 283 seconds in the succinylcholine group versus 329 in the rocuronium group, with a significant p-value. The mean recovery period for patients that became hypoxic was 43 seconds in the succinylcholine group versus 36 in the rocuronium group, and that was also statistically significant. This is enough evidence for me to make rocuronium my go-to agent of choice for most intubations. That doesn't mean that I think using sucks is wrong. But since SUX doesn't have any real advantages over the non-depolarizing agents, why use a drug where you have to worry about things like hyper-K and contraindications when you can do just as well with another agent?
And here's another medical term that desperately wants to be potterified. Hypertrichosis. This hair-raising spell would produce luxurious locks, but they might not sprout quite where you want them to be. Here's another concept that's starting to trickle down into airway management. Preoxygenation and intubation of the patient in a heads-up position rather than the standard supine position. The first time I heard about body position mattering for pre-oxygenation, it was in a talk at ASEP about caring for the super-obese patient. Unfortunately, American waistlines are continuing to expand at an alarming rate. And along with that, these people are developing chronic illnesses that make them more likely to require airway management. Managing the airway of a very obese patient is a whole discussion on its own. The only thing that I'm going to touch on here is the preoxygenation phase. Obese individuals have a decrease in lung and chest wall compliance and an increased airway resistance due to the mechanical compression of the lungs, chest wall, and abdominal wall from the weight of the overlying soft tissues and body fat. The patient's functional residual capacity is also reduced because the increased abdominal pressure impairs diaphragmatic movement. The compression of the chest increases alveolar collapse, VQ mismatch, and dramatically shortens the safe, non-hypoxic apnea time. This paper looks at preoxygenation in the heads-up position versus the supine position in obese patients. They included 42 patients with a BMI greater than 40 that presented for lap band surgery. Half of the patients were randomized to undergo preoxygenation in the, in the supine position, and the other half got preoxygenated with the head of the bed at 25 degrees. All of the patients, regardless of position, underwent RSI with a standard pre-medication protocol and received diprovan and sucks for the actual induction. After the endotracheal tube was confirmed to be correctly placed, the patient was allowed to remain apneic until the O2 sat reached 92%, at which time positive pressure ventilation was initiated and the time to reach 92% was recorded. On average, the patients in the group with the head elevated to 25 degrees had a significantly longer time to desaturation, although there was a pretty wide distribution in both of the groups. The average time to desaturation in the heads up group was 201 seconds, compared to 155 in the supine group. Notably, there was no difference between the groups in how long it took to recover back to an O2 sat of 97 after positive pressure ventilation was initiated. This has been looked at extensively in the obese population due to the restriction of the chest wall and diaphragm from the pressure of the abdominal and chest wall fat and soft tissue. But what about in the non-obese patient? This paper enrolled 45 patients, so it's a small study, but the point was made fairly easily. It took normal, healthy, non-obese patients that were undergoing general anesthesia and gave them all five minutes of pre-oxygenation prior to induction. They were divided into three groups. Group 1 got standard preoxygenation in the supine position. Group 2 got preoxygenation with the head of the bed lifted to 20 degrees. And Group 3 got preoxygenation in the supine position with 5 centimeters of water of PEEP. After they were all successfully intubated, they were allowed to be apneic until their O2 sats dropped to 93%. What they found was that the group with the head of the bed lifted to 20 degrees had the longest duration of non-hypoxic apnea, with an average of 452 seconds. That's nearly seven and a half minutes. Whereas, the standard pre-oxygenation group made it to 364 seconds, and the PEEP group, 415 seconds. The difference was statistically significant for the heads up group, so this works for the non-obese patient too. And for those of you that are interested in gender equality, there is a similar paper that included only female subjects. They included 35 healthy women undergoing anesthesia for elective cholecystectomy, and they were pre-oxygenated for three minutes in either the supine position or with the head of the bed elevated to 20 degrees. Again, after a successful intubation, the women were allowed to become apneic until the O2 saturation declined to 95%, at which time they were placed on a ventilator. As you can see, 
there was again a significant difference in the non-hypoxic apnea times between the groups, with the average time to desaturate to 95% on the pulse ox at 386 seconds in the heads-up group, as opposed to 283 seconds in the supine group. So we've determined that pre-oxygenation works better if the patient is positioned sitting in the upright or semi-recumbent position rather than supine. But what about the actual intubation? Should we lie the patient back for that or just keep them more upright? This paper just came out this April, and for me, this one was a game changer. It's not perfect because they included intubations in locations outside the ED, although they did not include patients in the OR. It's retrospective as opposed to prospective, and the only other real weakness I see is that all of the patients included underwent direct laryngoscopy as the initial attempt, and in many facilities, video laryngoscopy has sort of supplanted direct laryngoscopy as the initial approach of choice. Nonetheless, I think that the data is still fairly telling. They included 528 patients in the analysis, and the primary endpoint was a composite of difficult intubation meaning more than three attempts or taking longer than 10 minutes to achieve adequate endotracheal tube placement, aspiration, hypoxia, O2 sat less than 90, and esophageal intubation. So here is how they achieved the bed up, head elevated position that the protocol called for. The patient was placed supine, and then the bed was raised and the head lowered into the T-bird position for a moment in order to be able to scoot the patient up to the head of the bed and prevented them from sliding down the gurney when the head of the bed was raised. They then raised the head of the bed to 30 degrees. If the patient was obese or needed a bump up to align the airway, this was done after the head of the bed was raised. Think aligning the ear to the sternal notch and you should be just about where you need to be. The most common complication was hypoxemia, which occurred three times more frequently among the patients in the supine position as the head elevated position. Aspiration and esophageal intubation rates were similar, but interestingly, the airway was found to be more difficult in the supine patient group as well. The overall frequency of complications in the supine group was more than double that of the head elevated group, as indicated by the odds ratio of 0.42 in favor of head elevation. Even when the authors controlled for BMI and operator experience, the differences remain significant. For me, this paper is probably going to change much my practice. If elevating the head of the bed to 30 degrees during my intubation attempts has the potential to decrease the rate of peri-intubation complications, then I'm all about it. It doesn't cost anything, it's easy to do, and it doesn't require any fancy equipment. In my case, being um, vertically challenged, I may have to bring a box or a stool to the head of the bed, but that seems a small price to pay for more time without hypoxia and a lower frequency of complications. This bit of medical jargon would make for a really uncomfortable curse. Globus hystericus, choking yet laughing at the same time? Ugh. Let's wrap up our discussion of advanced airway management by discussing a fairly recently developed concept, delayed sequence intubation. We all grew up in emergency medicine and cut our teeth on the concept of rapid sequence intubation in which a patient who requires intubation for a variety of reasons is pre-oxygenated prior to the administration of an induction agent and neuromuscular blockade in order to create optimal conditions to gain visualization of the airway, thus allowing for orotracheal intubation. The goal is to create a large enough reservoir of oxygen in the patient's lungs that you don't have to provide any positive pressure ventilation during the intubation attempt in order to try and minimize gastric insufflation and reduce the risk of aspiration. This technique works fantastically well the majority of the time, but we've all had those cases where we've had to modify this standard approach based on what's happening with the patient in front of us. So first of all, DSI is not a technique that applies to every intubation you do. Most of the time, 
we can adequately pre-oxygenate our patients with conventional techniques. When you think about it, many of the patients we intubate have normal lungs. We're intubating for airway protection after a head injury or an overdose, for example. However, delayed sequence intubation is the technique that applies to the patients that you can't pre-oxygenate easily with our standard approach. When a patient is not adequately pre-oxygenated, it drastically shortens the patient's safe apnea time, so the patient is much more likely to have a desaturation event during the intubation attempt. By breaking the steps of RSI down into separate components, it allows us to more safely proceed with the intubation attempt by improving our ability to adequately pre-oxygenate the patient. To really understand why this approach has merit over our standard approach, let's take a minute to talk about pulmonary physiology. Before you all curl up into a ball and die, I promise I'll keep it short and to the point. A wise ED doc taught me during residency that all you need to know about physiology is that, is that air goes in and out, blood goes round and round, and oxygen is good. That pretty much sums up what you need to accomplish with your resuscitation efforts, but let's go just a little deeper than that. In a normal lung, during inspiration, room air containing approximately 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and about 0.5% carbon dioxide enters the lungs. Deoxygenated blood from the periphery enters the lung and carbon dioxide diffuses out of the blood while oxygen diffuses into the blood and binds to deoxyhemoglobin. This air is then expired to dispel the carbon dioxide and the cycle repeats. In a healthy patient, hemoglobin returns to the lung with an oxygen saturation of about 65 to 70 percent, so only a brief exposure to the oxygen-rich environment in the lung is adequate to fully reoxygenate the hemoglobin to 98 to 100 percent saturation. Let's talk about hypoxia for a second. Basically, there are five causes of hypoxemia. Low inspired partial pressure of oxygen, diffusion problems in the lung such that oxygen can't get across from the alveoli into the blood, dead space, which is perfusion without ventilation, shunt, which is ventilation without perfusion. Both dead space and shunt fall into the category of VQ mismatch. And last, low SVO2 in the venous blood returning to the lungs due to increased oxygen extraction. The first one, low inspired PO2, is relatively easy to fix. Give supplemental oxygen. If you're at altitude, descend. Diffusion problems happen when there is something that prevents oxygen and carbon dioxide from being able to diffuse across the alveolar membrane. It can be that the membrane itself has been thickened or destroyed, such as in pulmonary fibrosis, or that there is pulmonary interstitial fluid that functionally thickens the membrane and decreases the efficiency of diffusion, such as in ARDS. Dead space occurs when there is a portion of the lung that is getting ventilated, but getting inadequate perfusion. The classic example of this is pulmonary embolism. You can get air in and out just fine, but there's no perfusion to a portion of the lung because there's a big clot blocking the blood flow. In shunt physiology, it's basically the opposite. The lung is getting blood flow, but is not getting adequately ventilated. A shunt can be anatomic, as in the case of an AV malformation, where the blood is simply bypassing the alveoli altogether. Or it can be physiologic, where atelectasis or alveoli full of fluid or pus prevent any availability of oxygen for gas exchange. Both of these result in the phenomenon we refer to as VQ mismatch, where the ventilation and the perfusion the lung is getting don't match up. Lastly, if a patient has increased metabolic demands, like what occurs in a septic patient with tissue hypoxemia, more oxygen is extracted from the circulating blood than in a normal, healthy person. Because of this, the blood returning to the lungs has a lower SVO2 than normal and would require longer than normal transit time in the lung in order to fully oxygenate. But since most of these patients are hyperdynamic, the blood doesn't have long enough transit time through the lung to complete gas exchange. So how does all of this apply to our airway management strategy? Well, 
the patients who are likely to be intubating for inadequate oxygenation may have one or more of these problems. Take the septic patient, for example. A septic patient with pneumonia or ARDS has a diffusion problem because the alveoli are filled up with pus and inflammatory fluid. Since oxygen can't diffuse across the alveolar membrane into the blood, this creates a physiologic shunt, since blood passing through the capillaries can't pick up oxygen. Septic patients also often have increased metabolic demands as well, and thus will extract more oxygen from the blood at the tissue level, causing the blood that returns to the lungs to be more depleted. As the blood passes through the lungs, it doesn't have time to fully oxygenate. So you can see how these patients have hypoxemia that is often multifactorial, and why some of these folks have hypoxemia that can't be overcome just by the administration of supplemental oxygen alone. Of course, hypoxic patients also can have behavioral issues that make them difficult to oxygenate as well. We've all seen patients get hypoxic agitation before, thrashing about in bed and ripping the oxygen or CPAP mask off, usually right before they go into a bradycystolic arrest from their respiratory failure. This delirium and the resulting agitation also increases oxygen consumption and worsens the hypoxemic state. So it's important to get behavioral control of these patients rapidly to protect them from preventing their own medical stabilization. Otherwise, they are likely to develop worsening hypoxemia and arrest. Let's get back to the concept of DSI. The whole point of DSI is to help you get these difficult to oxygenate patients adequately pre-oxygenated so that you can safely get them intubated without desaturations during your attempt. The concept of DSI is that you are separating the induction from the paralysis phase of RSI. Think of this as doing a procedural sedation in which the procedure itself is pre-oxygenation. After successful completion of that procedure, you administer your paralytic agent and proceed with intubation just like you normally would. In order to make this work, we need a sedative agent that can cause adequate induction of a patient, but without loss of their airway reflexes and respiratory drive. Fortunately, we just happen to have such a drug. Ketamine. Just like you would do for any procedural sedation, the dose is 1 to 1.5 mg per kg IV push. You do want to push it a little bit slowly. If you hammer it in in a rapid bolus, you can cause a brief period of apnea. That's not a big deal in most procedural sedations we do, since it typically only lasts about 30 to maybe 60 seconds and then they start breathing again. But a particular patient who's already hypoxemic, you'd prefer that they continue to breathe. Once the patient has dissociated from the dose, in order to make this work, we need a sedative agent that can cause adequate induction of a patient, but without loss of their airway reflexes and respiratory drive. Fortunately, we just happen to have such a drug. Ketamine. Just like you would do for any procedural sedation, the dose is 1 to 1.5 mg per kg IV push. You do want to push it a little bit slowly. If you hammer it in in a rapid bolus, you can cause a brief period of apnea. That's not a big deal in most procedural sedations we do, since it typically only lasts about 30 to maybe 60 seconds and then they start breathing again. But a particular patient who's already hypoxemic, you'd prefer that they continue to breathe. Once the patient has dissociated from the dose of ketamine, you'll be able to place your nasal cannula at 15 liters a minute and put your mask on right over that. That will give you a pretty high FiO2 for the patient to breathe, and the patient won't be wasting, wasting oxygen by thrashing around on the bed. If you have a patient that you think would benefit from some PEEP for pre-oxygenation, like an obese patient, or someone with pulmonary edema or pneumonia, stick them on a CPAP mask at so bottom line, does DSI work? This paper was published in April of 2015 and is an observational trial of 62 patients that were treated with delayed sequence intubation due to delirium or an altered mental status from their underlying medical condition that prevented them from tolerating successful pre-oxygenation via standard means. The average O2 saturation prior to the DSI procedure in this group was 89.9% but increased to an average of 98.8% afterwards, an average increase of nearly 9%.
32 patients had a saturation of less than 93% prior to the initiation of DSI, and all of these patients improved their O2 saturations, and all but three achieved an O2 saturation of 93% or greater after preoxygenation. The majority of patients got non-invasive positive pressure during preoxygenation, and only two patients had a decrease in saturation during the DSI process, and neither of these fell below 93% at any point during the intubation procedure. These data are pretty promising. It's a small data set, yes. However, it's a logical extension of our standard RSI procedure. And this data, this data set clearly provided safer intubating conditions than standard preoxygenation techniques. So I think that this is a very reasonable strategy for managing patients that are not able to be preoxygenated for behavioral reasons or altered mental status. I'll come clean and admit that I have used this technique a couple of times, and it actually worked out fantastically well. That is absolutely total anecdotal experience and not evidence but this is a technique that I'm going to keep in my back pocket for those challenging cases. Well, that's it for this month, folks. I hope that you all have a wonderful fall and a happy and spooky Halloween. I leave you with our final curse, Treponema Pallidum. This spell can only be reversed by the counter curse. Penicillin. 